I'm, uh, I'm Ken Lewisum, and I'm, uh, I'm still hosting this, on, uh, this presentation on behalf of the, um, the New Zealand Antarctic Society. And uh, so welcome to all of you, and welcome to our speaker, uh, Laura Andrews. Now, Laura, uh, yeah, as you can see from the blurb, was one of the three young adventurers who was invited by the, uh, the Antarctic Heritage Trust to join the, uh, the expedition to ski to the South Pole. Uh, this year is part of the Young Explorers Program, so you see the Heritage Trust banners here, so we're still we're piggybacking on that. So, Laura's role as a firefighter and the first responder at the Auckland Airport, and the, the training behind it means that she was really, really well qualified to deal with all sorts of incidents, you know, the sort of disasters that, uh, that you, you know, if something really, really goes horribly wrong. But that didn't really prepare her very well for a long, hard slog in some pretty arduous conditions. But um, what, what did set her up for the long haul is a uh, history of doing the firefighter stair climbs, you know, with all the gear on and going up, you know, story after story. And lots and lots of outdoor activities on foot and on bike and road bike and whatever. But uh, in addition, in 2021, she uh, finished both the Coast to Coast and the Ironman, you know, they're only about a month apart. And they're, they're, it's a big achievement because they're completely different events and just sort of different requirements. There's a hell of a lot of training to do that. But they're, they're pretty much sprint races, you know, so, you know, half a day, a day, it's all done, and uh, you go home and have a lie down. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so last year she did Gonza, which is a five to ten day adventure race where you just go and go and go and sleep if you dare. So that's getting used to that long haul, day after day endurance stuff. And, uh, and then followed her up with a tour of Alvarela, which is, uh, which is um, Cape Ring and Bluff by Mountain Bike. And, uh, and you sort of do it in your own time and you get to sleep at night if you, if you choose. And uh, she managed that in 33 days, so it's a, a ski trip to the South Pole should be easy. Well, I'll leave that to Laura to tell you how easy it really was. <laughs>
Last year, I had the privilege to trade all of that in for a world of contrast. To go to the place at the bottom of the world. A world of isolation, with average temperatures of negative 25. Me and a team of five, four, four others, would follow in the footsteps of those like a Munson, Scott and Hillary. It would be just me and the team, alone on the ice. Tonight I have the privilege of sharing my story with you. I'm not going to claim to be an Antarctic expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a daring explorer, venturing into the unknown. But what I am is an ordinary Kiwi girl. I've been inspired and I'm curious. And I had a really incredible opportunity last year to ski to the South Pole. Our story is not one filled with glory and overcoming obstacles or our ship getting stuck in ice. But it's a story of ordinary people stepping into an extraordinary world. We spent 50 days skiing to the heart of Antarctica. Over that time, I had about 450 hours of skiing, just me and my head and a, and a line in the ice on my own. So I had plenty of time to try and think about how I was going to share the story when I came home. Tonight, I'm going to share a little bit about our journey and what it was, about some of the things we had to consider, the physical and mental journey, and what that means for us today. Throughout this talk tonight, I hope you're going to see a bit of two key themes that I've found resonated through my journey and through those of the explorers that came before us. These innately human traits are applicable in a polar explorer expedition and in our everyday life. I found that resilience is key. Resilience is our own personal resilience, but it's also increased with our preparation, the knowledge sharing, and teamwork. I found that with so much time and space to think, I experienced an almost childlike curiosity, wondering what our place was in the world, how things were, and why they are the way they are. Often in our normal lives, we're filled with clutter and too busy. We don't have time to be curious. But it's this curiosity which drives us forward as humanity, and curiosity that will help us through the global challenges that we're facing today. I hope the things that we learned in our preparation execution, and reflection of our time on the ice can draw a few parallels to living a curious and fulfilled life back home. Let's start at the beginning, I guess. How does one get the opportunity to go to the South Pole? I was selected as one of three inspiring explorers to partake in the Antarctic Heritage Trust's ninth inspiring explorers expedition. Based just across the courtyard from here, the Trust is a fantastic New Zealand not-for-profit who are on a mission to conserve, share, and encourage the spirit of exploration. They care for some of the original bases of Antarctic explorers, Bolsheviks, Scott, Shackleton, and Hillary. They're attempting to continue the legacy of exploration through life-changing experiences like this one that I was on today. The Trust didn't know it, but I considered myself one of their inspiring explorers long before they knew who I was or who when I was selected. In 2018, I saw two people I followed on Instagram, Holly Woodhouse and Brando Yellowich, come together in this crazy polar white world. They were crossing Greenland on the Antarctic Heritage Trust expedition to celebrate and commemorate the life of Friedrich Nansen. The pure beauty of the polar region, combined with the physical and mental challenges that they overcame, had me inspired and had me hooked. I knew that I wanted to be just like them. Over the next few years, I applied for the next expedition, and the next expedition, and the next expedition. <laughs> All the while delving into a more adventurous and action-filled life. Like Ken mentioned, I found myself on some classic Kiwi adventures. COVID certainly helped explore my own backyard. I pushed myself in the local coast to coast, tried my dedication to training by signing up and completing an Ironman, and experienced a small team endurance epic through the God's Own Adventure Race. I found a love for long distance travel as I threw hiked the South Island section of the Tiaroa Trail and then biked the Tua Aotearoa route. All these adventures built my character and my skill sets to be a good fit when this expedition finally came around. One of the great things I find about this Inspiring Explorers program is not only does it change the life of those who are on the experience, but the ripple effect expands much further beyond. And like tonight, you guys are all here to help share that story. The ninth Inspiring Explorers Expedition was announced. 
It was going to be a ski expedition to the South Pole. A team of five would ski from the edge of the Antarctic continent to the geographic South Pole, which was first discovered by Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. The expedition was celebrating 150 years since its birth and would recognize his success and draw parallels between modern exploration and his heroic era journeys. Amundsen was an incredible man. He was tenacious and daring. He was known for his ruthless leadership, taking all extremes to learn about the environment that he was going to and how to best survive there. He was really particular about his efforts and the people that he selected to go with him. This all accumulated in his success in the famous race to the South Pole. I knew that this expedition was something that I wanted to be a part of. The enormity of the expedition drew me in. It was going to be the biggest, the longest, and the most physically demanding, inspiring explorer's expedition yet. I don't think when I saw the application I necessarily knew exactly what I was signing up for, but I knew that I really wanted to be a part of it. I had a minor hiccup with the application process. The first question asked if you were an advanced skier. As a self-proclaimed intermediate to an advanced snowboarder, I clicked no, and big red letters flashed up on the screen saying that you're not eligible for this application. <laughs> small, small load up. I stared at these red letters and my heart sang and I knew, I knew that I had to do something about this. And I realised that the expedition was three months away, and I'm a shift worker, so you know, I've got a bit of time. So I sent the trust a cheeky email and said that in the spirit of inspiring explorers, I've got enough time, I'm willing to learn, let me consider applying. And so they said yes, and obviously worked, because <laughs> six months later I was standing in the South Pole. I'm not sure if it was my audacity, but here we go. I was now South Pole bound, alongside inspiring explorers, New Zealand two-time Olympian, and avid adventurer Mike Dawson, Norwegian polar explorer, ex-military, and current intelligence analyst slash spy, Martin Brindenburg. We've been guided by one of the best international polar guides, Norwegian Bent Rotmo, who was one of the first to ski the Northwest Passage. And our expedition leader would be the Trust's executive director, direct debatably, and in my opinion, one of the polar history experts. Nigel Watson. Between the historical polar knowledge of Nigel, the modern polar knowledge of Bent, and the enthusiasm and skill sets of Mike and Marta, I felt like this expedition would be an incredible blend tying the past, present, and future of exploration together. Amundsen once said that victory awaits him who has everything in order. While most expeditioners who undertake something of this scale in these environments, would usually take at least a year to train, often going to Norway, Greenland, or Baffert Island to do some extra training in these kind of conditions. We had three months. From the moment I was selected, training consumed my life. I had constant communication with the team and with past inspiring explorers to try and understand what I'd signed myself up for. We had frequent Zoom calls at strange hours of the night between New Zealand and Norway and wherever in Europe might be working. I read the works of Scott and Amundsen in Shackleton to try and get a feeling for what it was going to be like in this icy barren world. Mm -hmm. I looked for modern books too, particularly from a female perspective, and found Felicity Ashton's book of what it was like to be in what was once known as the Landless Land. Finally, <coughs> like Ken said, my tyres became my extension. For training, I upped my food intake to account for an increased training load, and by the end of the trip, I was trying to fit in 30 hours of training a week around my full-time job. I was trying to add a little bit of bulk to have sacrificial weight for the inevitable calorie deficit that we were going to face. I went to a local car tyre shop and asked for some spares, and they happily gave them to me. It was a little bit of effort to try and drill it through, but these things became my lifeline. I trained in the forest, on the beach, and on the back roads. I got a lot of really interesting questions. The best moment was when I actually had somebody come up to me and ask, are you training for a polar expedition? Because that's not very common in New Zealand. I even took a trip down the South Island, I'm from Auckland. I 
came on a romantic trip with her boyfriend and bought a third wheel. <laughs> <laughs> People were really amazing and they were always interested in the story. They were enthusiastic and ready to help. I went down to Snow Farm to get my first experience on Nordic skis. Also, not a very popular thing in New Zealand. But Snow Farm is a great place and I had the great help of this guy Bernie who happened to be a US ski coach. Worked out very well. So, these people were always willing to help in whatever way they could. Even if it was just adding a bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> November rolled around really quick, and all the prep we had done had to be enough. The team met for the first time in person in Santiago before flying down to Punta Arenas at the bottom of Chile. We had a week to pull together all our gear, do some crash learning on polar etiquette, and get to know each other. You can't imagine what it's like to try and pack for a 50-day remote expedition for five people, particularly when none of us have seen that gear before. We spent a whole day packing breakfasts, a special secret recipe of oats and raisins and oil. We spent a whole day packing lunches and half a day packing dehydrated dinners. We prepared 4,500 calories a day per person when we were expecting to burn 6,000. We cut weight wherever we could, even trimming up the nice sleds that we had kindly been donated. We streamlined, it, streamlined ourselves to become as efficient as possible while maintaining enough gear for survival in harsh Antarctic conditions. My first attempt on my skis that I was going to take the stuff off was on a cardboard box outside our Airbnb. <laughs> we had crashed horses and sped up, stove assembly, polar food prep, and correct layering. We had briefings with the Antarctic Logistic Expeditions around safety, using satellite imagery and radar imagery to identify the crevasse fields. The route that we would be doing was the Mesner route, and it hadn't been done three years prior to us finishing it. The learning curve I found was incredibly steep. I found Punta Arenas a really amazing city to be in. Like Christchurch, it's a gateway city, so there's ties to Antarctica on every corner. There were monuments to Antarctic explorers, and plaques identifying each building. We visited Chapleton's bar and Lady Sarah Broad's house where he went for help to rescue his crew on his great effort. And we met Alejo Stating, the first Chilean to ever reach the pole and one of the first polar guides to climb Mount Vincent. Our last task in Punta Arenas was the expeditioner's superstitious kissing of the foot. <laughs> the Statue of Magellan has been known for a long time and he couldn't let us leave it without of course, at this time, COVID was still a really prime issue. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that we shine that foot up really well with the amount of hands that we the first <laughs> Finally, we were ice bound. With 513 kgs of gear that was going to be shipped to the ice, we went to Antarctic Logistics and I got the best boarding pass that I'll probably ever get in my life. Our expedition was to be 920 kilometers of skiing from the Ron Ice Shelf to the geographic South Pole. We would climb 2,800 meters, experience rolling sand dunes of ice, and navigate around crevasse fields. To emulate a month's journey, we used food depots where we would resupply food and fuel. We started on the 18th of November, a week later than expected due to weather conditions on the ice delaying the plane from Chile to Antarctica. This was the first sign of us being at the mercy of the mighty continent and its wild conditions. We flew on a Boeing 757 from Punta Arenas to the Blue Ice Roadway at the Antarctic Logistics Union Glacier. Has anybody here been to Antarctica? Yeah, you've been in there? Yeah, yeah the Antarctica. <coughs> so if you've been, you guys can understand what this feeling when you first step off that plane and the gravity of that moment hits you, you look around and it's 360 degrees of ice and barren wasteland. The mountains there that we saw were towering up, coming out of glaciers, which were hundreds of meters deep. The cold hit you like a wall, <coughs> took your breath away as you just stood around in awe. I was pretty lucky, being, I was pretty excited to get here and flying in as the Clouds clear and you realise it's not clouds, it was ice that you're looking at. 
And uh, one of the things that Pink said to me and Marta as we were really excited about this is like, calm down, be careful. You gotta make it to the end of this expedition. The blue ice runway is literally that. It's blue ice and it's pretty slippery. And coming off of a side little pipe could be really easy to slip and break something. And that would have been the end of the trip before it had even started. From Union Glacier, we took a twin otter plane to the edge of the Ron Ice Shelf. At this point, we were dropped off. This was the first moment that I truly understood the scale of what we were about to undertake. We were tiny blips on this big, frozen ocean. It had taken us five hours of flying over ice to get here, and we had a lot further to go. When that small plane took off, and the engine buzz disappeared, and the plane disappeared over the horizon, the silence was heavy. We were tiny specks, and with 920 kilometers ahead of us, it was quiet, calm, and exciting, but it was also incredibly daunting. There was nothing to do but to head south. Our daily schedule on the ice was pretty regimented. With 24 hour daylight, it's good to have a routine. At 6 a.m., we'd start boiling water. We'd boil water for an hour and a half, warming up the water that we'd defrosted from the night before. We'd eat our breakfast, have a coffee, and then go through the dramatic process of putting your expedition gear on in a tent about this height. By 8.30, we'd have finished all this, and so we'd start to take down camp. Initially, this was a bit of a cluster, as we were still trying to figure out how we work together. But by the end of this trip, we were a smooth operating machine. Our 9 a.m. departure would start with a briefing from Bing, with a weather forecast from Antarctica distance and what we were expecting for the day. We would ski up to nine lengths, which consisted of one hour on and 10 minutes break. Within that 10 minute break, you'd expect it to fix your feet, change your layers, eat, pee, and drink. Now when you're in Antarctica, these minor tasks take a long longer. Everything has a much bigger consequence. We had three layers of gloves on, so try and get your water bottle open, or open your Ziploc bag with your lunch in it. Everything was hard. We had a long-handled wooden spoon for those cold days where you didn't want to take your gloves off so that you could <coughs> eat with your mittens. Everything was spoonable. Even our corn chips would be crushed into a pulp. It's a very effective way to eat chips. <laughs> it was a really, it was an art form for us to try and figure out that temper regulation. Changing your layers in the cold and the exposed was hard. You wanted to do all of that in your tent. Halfway through the day, we'd stop for lunch. Here's our nice little Ziploc bags with a one or two days of food. It was, a, it was a personal preference whether or not we packed one day or two day. And um, I'm definitely, I packed two days and I wish I packed one. Because after that first day and I'd eaten all my cookies and all my delicious things, the next day I just had nuts and seeds. <laughs> I kind of like a roller coaster like this. What we had to do is learn to walk at group speed. It wasn't necessarily anybody's ideal speed. For some, it was too fast, and some, maybe it was a little too slow. But we had to find that speed together to try and figure out how we'd all get to the South Pole, and be able to show up each day consistently. Our lunch breaks were pretty glorious. On a sunny day with no wind, it was like a polar picnic. We'd have our crackers and cheese, enjoy the sunshine, layer up, and enjoy the views around us. On cold days with the wind, you wouldn't want to stop for long. So for our lunch break, we'd set up the tent and occasionally put the stove on. This is one of the highlights of my trips, actually, is the lunchtime break in the tents, because it was an opportunity that you got all together to share your stories and your thoughts for the day. We were able to defrost our face masks, which had often frozen to our faces, and potentially put like new hand warmers in our boots if it was really cold. Once we had reached our time limit skiing, at the end of the day, we'd search for a flat campsite. <laughs> now you'd think that Antarctica this would be easy, but the frozen waveforms referred to as sastrugi weren't ideal to sleep on. Camp setup also became a smooth and efficient system. And by the end it became a race about who could get their water and their stove going on first. It was Mike and I versus Nigel and Ben. And as Nigel and Ben had lots more experience, it took us a while, but eventually I feel like Mike and I bought them. Back in the tents, stoves on. 
and then boiling water for another three to four hours. During this time, we'd repair all our gear, change up all our layers, try and record our day in our diary. At dinner time, we'd pile into one tent and have an evening brief, catching up with everything that had gone on. Beaked would call and tactical logistics for a daily schedule call, stating our location and conditions, and would pass it on to the expeditioners behind us. Throughout this journey, we expected to be passed multiple times. There was 18 expeditions on the ice, but we ended up in the lead for most of it. Slow and steady. By the time we would lay down to go to bed, it was often close to midnight. As the time drew on and we got more tired, we gained altitude and we skied longer days because we were stronger, but we slept shorter nights because it took longer to boil the water. Throughout this journey, we realized that Antarctica is a hostile environment. Nothing survives there, not even us. From the day we started, we were in a calorie deficit, slowly wasting away as we expended more than we could burn. Our cuts and wounds wouldn't heal at their normal pace, and everything took a bit longer. By the end of the expedition, we'd all lost weight. Thankfully, I lost the sacrificial weight that I put on, but some members of our team lost 12 kgs, which is pretty significant over two months. Throughout our journey, we celebrated the milestones we had, whether it was the first 10k, the next 100k, 10 days. I made the local newspaper in my hometown of Waipu, which is a one street beach town in Northland, that we'd made our first turn left on day 19. <laughs> We'd been heading the same direction southwest for 19 days to pass the large crevasse field that's formed by the flowing foundation ice stream. And now we could aim for the gap beyond the Pensacola Mountains and start heading south. A highlight for us was passing through Fields Corner, which is where a fuel depot is set up with small planes going through to the South Pole. Here we met an Antarctic Logistics logist Traverse Team, consisting of three Kiwis and one Canadian. On day 24, I was not expecting to run into any people. I was definitely expecting to have to deal with this when I got to day 40. But at this point, I realized I could either be really stoked about it or really gutted that my isolation experience was gone. As you can tell, I went for stoked, particularly when I realized that Kiwi Ben had worked with a firefighter that I'd worked with. And these two degrees of separation from New Zealand extended down to the 85th parallel in Antarctica. We were really stoked to spend a rest day there, doing our resupply. We even helped them set up a weather station. It was really cool to feel like we contributed to the greater Antarctic network. While we were there, and you guys were here, celebrating your kind of soggy New Zealand Christmas, we celebrated Christmas too. <laughs> we had a Norwegian Christmas, then we had a Kiwi Christmas, and then we had an Antarctic Christmas. We even had a surprise cheesecake for Martha's 31st birthday. It was interesting conditions because in that kind of cold, you don't cook it, you don't throw it out. We had to try and heat it up over the stove, and even then it was still pretty icy. But the extra calories were definitely appreciated. Our food supplies looked like this. Little flags on the horizon that we'd turn up to, and our food bags and fuel had been buried under the snow. We'd dig them out, excited, because who remembers what they've packed 40 days ago? And you'd be excited to see what you could find. I really cherished the written letters that I'd packed from my friends and family back home. It was a really nice connection. Let's have a little bit of a talk about gear. Antarctica is a forbidding place. Inland, there's no food and no existence. It was the strangest thing being surrounded by a frozen ocean, yet water became our most enduring task. Our stoves and fuel were quite liberating our lifelines. Unlike Amundsen and his dog sleds, our expedition was man-powered, which meant that we couldn't use backpacks and we couldn't have anything too heavy, so we had sleds and skis. Demonstrate it, yeah. Everything had a purpose. We stripped everything back to make sure that we had the bare minimum. I was reading today that in amongst the ship, the Fram, they had 3,000 books, pianos, harmonicas, <laughs> and extensive Christmas apparel. We weren't quite that lucky. We had these super cool bedding bags that went on top of our sleds like this, which meant that we could just pull it off our sled at the end of the day and straight into the tent. Had pockets for easy access for our food and water, and anything else you didn't want frozen went underneath. 
would set up camp and drag the whole thing inside. I shared my tent with Martin for 50 days, and you learn a little bit about people's personalities. Martin had done most of her polar experience in the Arctic, where snow inside the tent can have catastrophic effects. So our tent was always ship shape, and the snow brush was a central part of coming in and out of our tent. The boys didn't have the same kind of standards. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our little tent set up on the inside. I'm just gonna give you guys a little video a little bit of a tour. I hope the volume's are right, so we can adjust it if we need. Home sweet home. Today's achievement is my tower of ice. Relations. 
Speaking of navigation, our navigation was set each day using an electronic GPS. We couldn't hit magnetic cell because of the deviation between the magnetic south pole and the geographic south pole. One of the things I learned on this journey was that Antarctica has four poles of significance. The geographic pole, which was our objective, is the bottom of the rotational axis of the Earth. The magnetic pole is the bottom of the magnetic field, and it moves a bit further away each year. The pole of inaccessibility, I think it was claimed by the Russians, is the furthest point of Antarctica from any coast, and the geomagnetic pole is between the geographic and magnetic poles. It was really cool to see the closer that we got to the South Pole, the more the deviation expanded and the more we'd have to change our bearing. By the end, we were heading on a bearing of 130 degrees. As we're walking and we're recording our coordinates each day, riding them each night and vivid on the top of our tent, you can see those lines of longitude coming together closer and closer. And I kind of felt like I was living my high school geography class. Once our bearing was set in the morning, we'd navigate all day with the compass. But we'd also use the conditions around us. We could use the angle of our shadow on the snow, knowing that the sun would rotate above us 15 degrees each hour. We could use the wind direction of a ribbon on our pole, like Nigel's doing here. When the sun disappeared and our shadow went away, or when the wind flattened out and you couldn't use that anymore, we'd use the direction of the sastrugi under our feet. Worst case scenario, if we couldn't see anything, we had a chest harness, we would strip the compass in front of us. Over the course of the expedition, I found we became more and more in tune. Our line of skiers deviated from the course less and less, and even in the most adverse whiteout conditions, days before the pole, our course was true. It obviously worked, because in 50 days, 50 days later, in the middle of this outrageously large, two times the size of Australia continent, that's completely bland, with zero visual cues for you, we found the South Pole. <laughs> a journey of this length and in such hostile conditions requires fortitude. It requires both physical and mental strength. I'll be honest that in my preparations, the closer I got to the expedition, the more I googled and the more I read, the more I began to experience a bit of fear. We got to talk to Borge Ausland, a modern Norwegian explorer before we left. The best advice from him was to look after the top two inches and the bottom two inches. That means our mindset and our feet. They could make or break our expedition. We really had to look after ourselves. I'm going to talk to you guys tonight about three of the main fears that I had, which was frostbite, crevasses, and being the weakest link of the team. I found that despite being afraid of them all, they all happened. <laughs> and it's all right because we managed to overcome them. <laughs> Going to the polar regions, it's inevitable that cold injuries become a hazard. They're pretty scary. It's wild, it's remote, it's windy, and it's really freaking cold. I did the classic Google search of images and came up with those frostbites of like, big winters and his nose falling off, or people losing fingers, or people losing limbs. And I realized that this could affect my life, or it could, affect, and it could affect the expedition. I found out about polar fire, which is a severe case of chill blains, which is caused by cold and friction. And it often inflicts women, particularly on fatty areas, on polar endurance expeditions. As somebody who bulked up a little bit before this expedition, this was a really significant fear for me. The images, I'm going to warn you, this is quite a graphic image, so I'll flip through it fairly quickly, of um, Jenny Wordsworth's polar thigh look like this. So this is her thighs, and um, this is obviously quite an extreme case. So, I was worried about these. But what I learned is that you can manage these kind of things really well. With proper preparation and equipment and gear and medical advice, you can come through these polar cold environments and not be afflicted too badly. It was the first week when I first got my first sign of polar fire on my knees, and then on my thighs, and then after a day of unfortunate gastro, on my butt. Over the course of the trip, we got small frostbites on our hands, like when Mike was filming, or our cheeks, where they'd been exposed a little bit. But as soon as we caught them, we were vigilant. For polar thigh, you can use steroid cream and coverings to make sure that they don't open up. 
For frostbite, we can apply aloe vera gel, kind of like sunburn, and then cover it up. By the end of the expedition, we got to the South Pole, and the people there were surprised. We were one of the happiest and healthiest expeditions. There was two Norwegians who got there just before us, and for context, their eyes were so frostbitten that, that they were swollen, they bugged. And one of them had a massive patch on his beard missing from the ice school that he pulled off and ripped his beard out. And they were a lot faster than us and a lot more extreme. But I was really glad that we put this big focus on safety and came back with no lasting injuries. The next thing is crevasses. As you can see here, we're quite a few meters up. And those big lines in the ground under the plane wing are crevasses, tens of meters across. Antarctica is covered by an ice cap that's constantly in motion, which creates major cracking and crevassing. I hadn't really considered this hazard until we were in Punta Arenas, dangling our poles off the edge of the skate bowl in a crash course in crevasse rescue. I realised that that could be me inside the crevasse, hanging there with walls of blue ice, unable to hear the friend, my friends above who were trying to rescue me. Before this trip, I had zero crevasse experience. And the image that came to mind was of Vivian Hughes, snow bully, falling into the crevasse. <laughs> but I found, going back to Amundsen's words, we found success in order and preparation. We were able to avoid major crevasse zones that we could identify with the satellite imagery mm -hmm. radar. For any crevasses that we did experience, we had rescue equipment, some people with some good experience, and new rescue skills. While we did cross a few crevasses, the ones we did cross were snowed in pretty well. It was just kind of a little line on the snow that was even the evidence there. But we did see those massive ones as we were flying, and sometimes when we were walking, you could see them in the distance. There was one day we were walking along. It was wide out conditions, pretty miserable. You don't know up from down, you even get a little bit seasick. And that morning brief from Bent had told us that we were skirting around the edge of the crevasse field that day and we had to be extra vigilant. I was in the lead and I was checking my compass every 10 steps because without a doubt, if you don't, you're going to go off course. The person at the back can always see that really well and they see their mate bearing off, but as, uh, it's too windy to be able to tell them so you just kind of have to let them turn around, realise that they're wonky and then course correct. I was walking along in these wide out conditions and I suddenly heard a massive <laughs> and I felt my skis drop about this far. The mental image that I had here was that I was on a snow bridge over a crevasse and that was dropping down and I was about to fall into this gaping chasm and I was terrified so I boosted forward off this supposed snow bridge and turned around to check that my team were behind me. We took a moment to regroup and it was windy. It was hard to communicate. Then dug a hole and we had a look at the snow conditions. And for those of you with alpine experience, you probably know what this is. But when you have two layers of hard snow and a layer of soft snow in between, if you walk across it, it can collapse. And that's what happened. Over the couple of days, we had a few days of snow and then freezing, frozen, and got hard, and then that caused the collapse. Now in an alpine environment, it <coughs> can drop it and cause an avalanche. But here, in Antarctica, we're at a one degree incline. It was just a pretty scary feeling. What I found, as it wasn't necessarily the crevasse that was scary, it was the unknown. I didn't know what was going on, I didn't know what the noise was. But once I armed myself with that knowledge, and the experience passed on from Ken, um, sorry, from Nigel and from Bent, I knew that I could carry on happy and healthy. Now the next fear that I want to talk about is a pretty human one. And it's that fear of being the weakest link. I think in a team we've often, we've all experienced something like this. When the team was first announced, I was absolutely floored and humbled. I was going to Antarctica with an Olympian and a spy. <laughs> Nigel had been to the North Pole and crossed Greenland, and Vink was this epic polar guru. And I was really intimidated. I was worried that I wasn't going to be fast enough, and I wasn't going to be strong enough. I felt like I was just your ordinary girl from subtropical Northland who didn't really deserve to be in this spot. But what I learned from this expedition is that we all have strength in different ways, and it's not necessarily just physical. 
Strength is a combination of physical, mental, and emotional, and it's hugely influenced by your team spirit. It's not always constant, and some days I was the weak link, and somebody would help me out, take a little bit of weight, even if it was just one kg, and then it make the difference. But I found that some days I was the strength, and I could carry some weight for somebody else, or lend them a helping hand, or take an extra turn in the lead. I found that we could help each other, and it was always a constant flow, and that's what's important about being in a team. Our daily schedule of walking in a line, one by one, was a lonely teacher, because he didn't have anybody to talk to. But it was about helping each other out. The person at the front carried the mental load of the navigation, and the physical load of breaking the path, so for his friends and mates behind him. We were successful because even though we were strong individuals, we were an even stronger team. Our first weeks in Punta Arenas were incredible for team bonding. We went from strangers across the world to a team that thrived together. We did this by talking and learning about each other's strengths and weaknesses and how we dealt with stress. We lifted each other up, helped each other out. <coughs> it was really cool to learn from Mike, who bought his years of high performance sports side tricks and tools to help build a positive team culture, where he made us all feel like Olympians. Bent was a world of wisdom to us, and he made sure to pass his whole knowledge on not just be a guide. He made sure that we could stand on our own and survive on our own. Nigel led the team with an ever-present reminder of the heroes who'd come before us. He looked after us and kept us in stitches with his chronically bad dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and Marta, what can I say, but if you can share a two-man tent with somebody for 50 days and still be friends, I think that says a lot for the kind of friendship you've forged. She was my polar sister. Considering we were in the most isolated place in the world, I never truly experienced solitude. We worked so closely in a team, we're often never more than a few metres from one of your crew, even if you go to the bathroom. To cope for so long in such pro close proximity was a true testament to the great team culture we created. We went through some pretty massive moments together. While we were down there, Martha's mum passed away which was really hard. It was a blow to the team, and it exacerbated our extreme isolation. We really leaned on each other through this time. On the other end of the spectrum, we had some extreme highs. We got to be with Nigel on New Year's Day when he received the news that he'd been awarded the New Zealand Honours Antarctic Medal, which was an absolute privilege to be there on this expedition with him. <coughs> Working in a team was crucial to our success. We shared the load, emotional and physical, and I couldn't imagine this trip with anyone else. When I went through the application process and the interviews, I was asked how I would handle the blandness of the environment out there. For 50 days without trees and birds and beautiful views, how would I cope with the monotony? And the truth was, I wasn't sure. I don't know if anybody can prepare you for that. But Antarctica provided and I felt like the question, when they'd asked it, they had created a false perception. Because for 50 days on the ice, I experienced nothing but awe and wonder. I saw so many different styles of snow, and so many shades of white and blue. We saw clouds that would wrap around the curvature of the earth, and crazy weather systems that would roll over us, envelop us, and then pass on. I was fascinated with the ever-changing sastrugi, some of them waist-high or above our heads, and the shadows that were caused by the sastrugi and the ever-rotating sun above our heads. We saw sun halos and sun snow dogs, and unique tiny snowflakes that were so perfect, I cried. I saw iridescent clouds and rivers of ice particles that would roll across our knees ebbing and flowing like a river, the only sign the high catabolic winds that would roll off the polar plateau and down onto us. I'm not saying it was always easy. <laughs> we had hard days and hard moments. We had stormy weather that we had to endure. We keep grumpy. <laughs> but what I can say 
is that it was always worth it. To be there in that environment with these people was an absolute world of scope. You might imagine that 50 days repetitive on the ice could induce boredom, but it was anything but that. We found joy and gratitude in every moment, even if it's a seven minute yoga with Adrian moment, night, or finding a full Oreo in your food bag, and celebrate. Even a day in white out conditions, where going was tough, we were grateful for the opportunity to be able to test our newfound navigation skills. Throughout this journey, we noticed the smaller details and those tiny intricacies, the change of light or the tiny snowflake. We found awe and wonder in the environment around us and in the people that we were with. While I was there, I felt stripped back to the rawest version of myself. I felt all my emotions so deeply, and the smallest thing would bring me to tears of joy. I found that while I was walking along, my memories were so vivid, it was like I was reliving my life. My dreams and plans and schemes were as big and wide and limitless as the environment around me. In our moments of presence, we are there in that moment were more present than you could ever imagine. There's a certain beauty to living life in its rawest form. Stripped away from the hustle and bustle of life, disconnected from the world and any external obligations, our mission was really simple. Survive each day and ski south. We were right back to basics. Set up shelter, get water, fuel yourself, get enough sleep and repeat. On the 5th of January, it was wide out conditions. It was the coldest day of our journey yet, about negative 30 degrees with a wind chill of around negative 45. We were wrapped in every layer we had. We had chemical hand warmers in our gloves and in our feet. We stopped and changed them at lunchtime. Skiing along, eyes creating in the distance, we knew that today was the day that the South Pole would emerge. I stopped at one point to adjust my socks, so I was worried I was getting a blister because it was warmer, and Mike was double checking his navigation. As I looked up, I saw the others staring and pointing. The clouds cleared, and what I saw was out of this world. The dark, looming shapes of the South Pole Station, the telescopes and the research stations around it, emerged in stark contrast to the white that we've been seeing for 50 days. There it was, the bottom of the world. For 50 days we had skied, for three months we had trained, and finally, there it was. It was amazing. We were stoked, we were hyped, we couldn't believe that we'd finally made it. The next six kilometers took us three hours, and we walked in a comfortable silence, all exploring the journey that had got us to that point. Walking that final kilometer to the ceremonial pole outside the Amundsen Scott base, and seeing the 12 original signatory flags of the nations who had signed the Antarctic Peace Treaty was surreal. This place had been our whole world for so long, and these flags symbolise the collaboration of nations, the mutual understanding for the protection of this majestic flag. I've never felt prouder to see the New Zealand flag flapping alongside, and it was serendipitous that it was flapping alongside next to the Norwegian one, particularly after 50 days on a joint Norwegian Kiwi expedition. I'm just going to show you guys a wee video of what it was like when we walked in. South Pole is this way! Woo! You can see the station. It's finally in there and it's maybe 5k away. Maybe a little bit more. Oh, oh that's speechless at the moment. We've just got a bit of view of South Pole. Overwhelming, coming and going in the, in the cloud, but um, so I lost the words. Yes, on it to the pole.
photos actually the next day because we went back because it was better weather. <laughs> you don't go all the way to the South Pole and not get some photos. <laughs> I'm going to admit that coming back to the real world has been pretty tough. For 50 days we experienced solitude, isolation and quiet. And returning to the hustle and bustle was initially like being hit in the face with a cricket bat of noise. Everything I've read says that the ice never leaves you, and I'm sure that many of you here know why. I find that at the moment, I'll go to the pools and go swimming and submerge my head under the water just to get that muffled silence which we had out there. When I turn the tap on for my glass of water, for my water bottle, I think of the hours that we spent each day for that small service in our little tents. I know that I'm still processing what this expedition truly meant but I know that it's expanded my horizons. People always ask when you come back from something epic, what's next? And this time I smile because I had 50 days to plan. <laughs> so sometime, maybe 2025, Marta and I have penciled in a trip to the North Pole, hoping to continue the legacy that we were passed on. Through the Inspiring Explorers program, I know that my world has been expanded. The Inspiring Explorers program expands what you believe is possible. I don't know about you guys, but I'd never dreamed of skiing to the South Pole because it was nothing that was even on my radar. It felt so far beyond my reach. As New Zealanders, I know we have a certain magnetism to that great southern continent. I mean, here we are at the International Antarctic Centre, like a tribute to what's going on down there. Just across the runway, we've got the plains, that gateway, as they head over down to the ice to do the work down there. Right now we've got a southerly chill and it feels that that wind has come straight off Antarctica. <laughs> I almost reckon it's colder here. It feels like everybody knows somebody who has a connection some way or somehow. For me to have the opportunity to explore in that magical land, to ski for 50 days and see the flags of those signatory nations was an unknown dream come true. A lot of the other expeditioners we met have been planning their dreams for years, seven or more. They scrambled to find funding and to build the appropriate skill sets. And I felt so humbled and so privileged to represent the trust and walk in with an only a three month leader. I know that our journey had a purpose greater than just us. I think one of the things you think about a lot is what's the point of this? What's the importance of polar travel? or the importance of exploration? It's an enduring question that I found myself thinking about a lot in the time that I was down there. I believe that part of the importance of exploration is increasing human capacity. As we delve further into the world, we question and we expand. Exploration of the Antarctic and the polar regions is important, I believe, because it raises the profile and awareness of these fragile and remote environments and it gives us a greater understanding of our place in the greater world system. It was really amazing when we were down there to capture a glimpse of the stuff that's going on. We met some climate researchers. We helped direct the weather station. We saw documentaries being made. But it was, it was also really powerful to spend 49 days in the wild, remote areas that were completely untouched. Some of the places I've been, we went, I don't think anybody had been there before. The Antarctic Society aims to bring Antarctica to the world. And I like to think that this journey has helped spread that love a little bit further. Over the time of our journey, we had a huge outreach with friends, family, organizations like you guys. But we also reached over a million people online. They tuned into our story, connecting to us, the explorers that came before us, and the mighty continents that we explored. I found people were asking me about the four poles in Antarctica and asking me how we navigated, what we wore, and how our Munster knew when he had reached the South Pole. People are curious and they're inspired. I like to think that we created a bridge between the everyday person and that mystical continent that's at the bottom of the world. Our journey was one of resilience and of curiosity. It expanded us beyond our to our group of friends and families and followers. We had to dig deep, to lean on each other, 
and to realize that within each of us is a greater reserve than we've ever imagined. Those heroic explorers that you read about, idolize, they were humans too, and we can be like them by being resilient, brave in the face of our fears, and working together. To be curious, to expand ourselves, and to find time for that curiosity is grounding back to our human roots. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the ninth Inspiring Explorers Expedition, where we skied 50 days to the bottom of the world. Every day, I would turn around and look at the sled that was behind me, and I saw the whakatoki that I'd ridden across the front, and I'd recognize the importance of living the past, present, and the future. Kia whakatomuri, te haere whakamua. I walk backwards into the future with my eyes on the past. Thank you. <laughs> what, what would you do differently next time, or what was the sort of biggest mistake that you'd sort of, that you'd learn? Oh. I think a really hard thing for us was doing all the setup at Monte Arenas. Uh, so, like all our food we bought in a supermarket where it was all Spanish and food that we didn't know, <laughs> and it was effectively a Walmart. Like Punta is not the biggest of cities, so in future I would take more of our own food because. That was a, I think the lead up was really stressful. You know, I know we've been three months, um, and then it was such an unknown and such a steep learning curve, but it was really stressful. And once we got to the ice, that went away, but it would be nice to kind of avoid that. Yeah, 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 exactly. I don't know if the bread would have cut it down there, it would have been frozen. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. What's something you learned about polar travel that no one ever told you about? Ooh. <clears throat> I suppose we'd all thought about it, but nobody necessarily talked about it. But how to go to the bathroom when you've got all those layers on was a very, very steep learning curve. <laughs> I think you wanted to get right. Yeah. Yeah. David, David Lewis saying, I'm trying to get a two-inch pump through six-inch leg. <laughs> so what I get from your story is that it's an ever-changing landscape um, that um, you were talking about people visualize that it's all the same but it is a constant change yeah it was even even our presence there kind of changed the landscape so the winds that rip off the polar plateau and drop down those catabatic winds uh, constantly changing the ground. And if we set up our tents, it would create new sastrugi by the time we'd woken up. Um, it was really impressive to see after storm events, you'd come out and have to dig out your gear because of this new wall of ice. So you have to be really cautious of it and be aware of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, so what did you do with your human waste through the expedition? Yeah, so throughout most of the expedition, we buried holes. Um, we would have like we would dig quite a deep little trench and that would be the communal bathroom. Um, but at the la from the last degree in, it's kind of an area of convergence where all the expeditions come together and there's a lot more research around that area and stuff going on. So from there we carried our waste out and it was flowing back to Chile. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's pretty hard. I mean, I like to think that I've given a little bit of justice there, but to imagine the expense of where you work and there's just so much space and it's moving so quickly and then ice is moving around that like our little pile of waste frozen in time will not be discovered for archaeologists for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. And just another question, did you do any training at Snow Park? I, so I did go to Snow Park, yeah. yep. I actually learned to Nordic ski there. Um, I've, I've never done Nordic skiing before. Uh, so I did a couple of days down there and then I did maybe half an hour at Mount Hutt just up and down the learner slope. Which is not that satisfying. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that was very cool. Um, on the wind navigation, just interested in how that worked. Was that based on like a 
Did I get a full cast or is it just one per bag and one day? Or? You'd find, because we kind of navigate in like one hour chunks, like for our leg. So you'd set your compass bearing initially and the wind wouldn't really, like here in New Zealand the wind changes quite a lot, but there it was pretty consistent. And to be honest it usually came from the south. So for us most of the time if we put our pole up, our ribbon would be at a 45 degree angle, which worked out really well. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty cool. It took a little while to get used to, um, and like the early couple of weeks, our navigation was definitely a bit like this. Um, but by the end of it, we were pretty smooth. Yeah. Did you see any planes flying over um, as you walked? Yeah, we did. So it was surprising. The first plane we saw was quite a while after we started. So we initially had a food drop before Deal's corner, but they weren't able to fly it in because the weather conditions had been too bad. So the first plane that we did see was actually dropping us three days rations of emergency food. So it was pretty amazing, this little plane kind of came in, flew around, found us on the ice, did a circle, but because of the conditions couldn't land, so they just flew down to about 100 metres off the ground, basically stalled, and then this little parcel of bubble wrapped dehydrated food just came flying out the back. <laughs> and it was, like, it was really remarkable. <laughs> Talking to the pilots afterwards, it was a really cool experience for them too, because they don't often get to do that. So um, we, we had enough food to get to Peel's Corner, but if something had happened, like a bit of a storm or something, we could have been um, isolated for quite a long time, so it was better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, we, and then from the South Pole, from Peel's Corner onwards, we saw quite a few planes flying back and forth to the South Pole. And you can kind of tell the difference between you know, the twin other that we are flying on or the Basler, which is like a DC-3, which is what we came home on. Um, it was really exciting. Sometimes they fly low enough and wave at us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, awesome presentation. Thanks, Laura. Um, I was wondering, did you take anything digital down for entertainment? Like, did you have, were you listening to music at any stage or was it all pre or? Yeah. It I did actually. I, I knew that it was going to be long days on your own, so I downloaded a bunch of Spotify playlists and some Netflix. Um, but a fun fact for you is that your Spotify playlists disappear after 28 days, and your um, your Netflix disappears after 14 days. So our first storm day, I watched almost a whole season of something on Netflix, except for the season finale, and then the next day they disappeared. <laughs> so I kind of had to wait. But then I went on school, I took a couple of iPods and I had one in each of my depots, but they would only last about an hour before they'd die and they, even then I had to have it against my skin to try and let it last that long. Gotcha, thank you. No worries. Anybody else? I think I should probably acknowledge like we this expedition was put on by the trust and they did an amazing job of it, but we also had some really cool sponsors who came through. Ausland Explorers were, they guided us and they had the most accurate weather reports I've ever experienced. We were like 10 o'clock, it's going to snow, and it would. Um, Nodona were our clothing, they were our shells. Um, Cannon, obviously our papers. Joe Colgan were our sleds. Bringe were our base layers, our, our thermals. Um, so this was a really interesting difference, I guess, is our base layers were kind of like fishnet stockings. Um, but they're actually the warmest thermals I've ever worn in my life. I think the idea of it is that it creates air pockets and means that you breathe a little bit more, which is nice after 50 days in the same thermal. Um, Track Me gave us some garment inreaches, which were cool to be able to communicate with home when we needed. Health Sport were our tents and our sleeping bags, some really awesome sleeping bags that were great down to negative 70. As needs were the skis. Nord skis are really hard to get in New Zealand. Um, to be honest, anything polar is really hard to get in New Zealand. So we went through the Norwegian guys. And the road of Munson House passed on so much knowledge and showed us around Munson's house and told us these backstories about this man. It was really, really cool interaction. So yeah, cool guys. Well, does mm -hmm. anybody have any other questions? Yeah. What was the worst job? Uh, packing down or setting up camp? Uh, packing down because I was always late and the boys never were. <laughs> so like, you had this extra guilt of like they're standing in the cold waiting for you mm -hmm. while you're still in your cosy little tent. Not quite dressed yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but packing it, packing it, like setting up, you were always hungry because that was normally your time that you ate, like every hour on the hour you eat. And setting up, you'd finish, and it'll be another half hour to an hour before you actually got to eat. And by that point, you were starving. Um, yeah, real hungry. Well, um, Laura's brought some of the gear, and I think some of Nigel's here. Um, so, by all means, come up and have a look, and, you know, and I think Laura's going to be around a wee bit for, yeah, for more, sort of, more specific questions. But um, thanks very much for, for coming along this evening, and actually thanks very much to, to the, uh, the Antarctic Heritage Trust for, uh, for allowing Laura to speak at sort of an Antarctic Society, uh, <laughs> society event. So thank you, and have a good evening.